Thank you, Dave. Um, it's great to be here tonight, and uh, we're continuing our series on tonight's title is A Culture of Spiritual Fruitfulness. And we've been doing this series on culture in which we're not just looking at um, occasional spiritual experiences, but a whole way of life, a culture that shapes our lives. And uh, we particularly want to see how kingdom life and what it really means, what are the kind of qualities and values that mark a kingdom life. You know, sometimes you, you note a culture by the way somebody speaks or the way they dress or um, their sort of habits. This morning when I was preaching, somebody said to me afterwards, said to me, are you Welsh? Uh, and I said, why did you say that? It was just the way you preach. <laughs> and sometimes uh, a culture has those identifiable features. What are the identifiable? And someone say, are you part of the kingdom? What is it about a culture that really would mark us out as being? And that whole kind of charismatic culture, what is it that makes that charismatic culture and that kingdom culture? And we want to some, sense something of how we inspire that in what we share. So particularly looking tonight then at that spiritual fruitfulness and the culture of spiritual fruitfulness. Let me think of, of fruit. Uh, Fresh fruit, you just can't manufacture fresh fruit. You can process it, but you can't manufacture it. And yet you can cultivate it. You can help to grow it and uh, provide a context that's most conducive for it to be fruitful and grow. And so it is with spiritual fruit. We can't manufacture it, but we can open our lives up in a way that makes our life conducive to seeing that fruit grow. One of the things we've been sharing recently, uh, we took a group of leaders um, away for a conference a while back, and one of the interesting comments coming back is, you know, what were the things that you particularly noticed? But one of the common things a lot of folk was that the most helpful thing that we can bring to church life as leaders is to bring ourselves filled with the Holy Spirit. And there's something about the fruit of the Spirit that we cultivate it by cultivating in our lives the reality of that fullness of the Holy Spirit so the fruit of the Spirit is the overflow of a Spirit-filled life. In fact, when we were away this week, we took the senior leadership away for an overnight, as you can imagine, the most inspiring place to go. We were in West Wales and uh, breathing some of that air and down in a little place called Amroth, as some of you may know it. And uh, in Amroth, there's a lovely, we didn't have a chance to visit it this time, but um, there's a National Trust sort of garden place there. And uh, Pam and I have visited it many times. And it's got a, a, a lovely old um, kind of water channel that comes down where they've created steps that give a kind of wave effect down this channel. Either side of it, there's these beautiful plants growing, but at the top of it is a kind of big tank that's got a, a, a lip on it where the water, it fills up and it overflows and cascades down this waterfall. Just like you see sometimes in these kind of uh, uh, garden ornamental water features where you, know, you get in a garden, I remember seeing one the other day where it was a kind of jug and this jug, as it filled up with water, it was bent over and the lip would then, it would overflow and run down this channel, down into a little pool and then get recycled. And uh, but I saw another one in the same garden center where, in fact, it obviously got damaged at some stage and uh, the water was pouring into it, but it never ever got more than about half full because it all leaked out before it ever got there. And I've said many times, and it's so true, you know, that it's only in the fullness of the Spirit of God that we can overflow. And it's the overflow of that fullness that brings the fruit of the Holy Spirit. No matter if you're just half full, three quarters full, 99% full, it won't overflow. It's only when that jug, when it reaches the lip of the jug and then begins to overflow. And one of the things my prayer is for tonight is that by the end of this evening, we can open up to a time of ministry around communion where for many, we may experience a fresh fullness of the Holy Spirit. We can't manufacture the fruit of the Spirit. What we can do is cultivate a context in our lives that's most conducive for that overflow of the fruit of the Spirit. And so we're going to look at the fruit of the Spirit. Flash up on the screen, hopefully a reading for tonight, taken from Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 to 26. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. Father, we pray now that you would come. Come now by your Holy Spirit. Spirit of truth, guide us into truth. We pray that tonight may not just challenge us, but change us. To shape a culture, a way of life. 
to bring our lives in step with your spirit. Come now, Lord, and bring your word alive to us in such a way that we can see how it speaks practically into our life today. In Jesus' lovely and precious name, amen. Amen. Now, for your relief, I won't go through all nine in detail of these aspects of the fruit of the Spirit, but I'm going to take the first few and the last and just uh, try and give a glimpse of the whole way in which we understand the fruit of the Spirit. Firstly, love. Love is at the very heart of our Christian faith. It is the core of our culture. Indeed, even for a charismatic church with all the gifts of the Spirit, you know, if I speak with the tongues of men of angels but haven't love. It's just a clanging symbol. Yeah, you say, well, well, prophecy. But even if I've got the gift of prophecy, but haven't got love, it's nothing. So part of this culture, this charismatic culture, which we want to live in the fullness and work of the Holy Spirit and see the manifest gifts of the Spirit, key to it is this culture of spiritual fruitfulness. Love is at the heart of it all. Love is the motivation by which we seek to serve and minister. Love is the goal in which we seek to reach out to a world around us. It's that love which we said many times is so different to where we use the word in our natural, human, secular culture. But we use love in such a mixed way at times. I said many times we almost use love to describe the opposite to what it means. We use love to describe self-indulgence rather than anything else at times. When we say, I love, I don't know, I love salmon. It doesn't mean you've got a goldfish bowl in your house and you feed your salmon every day, you care for them, you look after them, you'd never have anything to happen. What it usually means, you like it grilled and rare and you eat it every day. And you think, so it's more about what I get, what I'm going to consume. And we live in a consumer culture and sometimes even in our church, therefore, it can become a consumerism. What we love about worship is what blesses me, what, what I get out of it. And it becomes a way in which love itself is more about what I get, what I get. I love that, I love her, I love that, I love those. Whereas true love is not about getting, it's about giving. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Whoever believed in him wouldn't perish, but have everlasting life. And this is culture of love that's about giving. It affects every area of our lives. Even in some of the most challenging, pressured areas. Even here tonight, there could be situations where just recently talking with a husband and wife whose marriage about to break up after years of married life and uh, seeking just to talk to them a little bit and say, but you know, weren't there times when you were madly in love with each other? Times when you didn't want to be apart, in fact. Times when your life was full of a love for each other. Yeah, he said, but it's too late now. There's no point in talking, he said. Why is that? Because I feel it's all gone. I'm empty. I don't feel I have any love left for her. Really? Where did that love originally come from? Was it something you manufactured? Was it something you'd sort of built up? Or do you really believe that God is the source of all true love? God is love. And if truly that source of love is what made that marriage relationship, what drew it was really a love that came from God, then God's not run out of it. You may feel you've run out of it. You may feel you've run out of patience. You've run out of all the other things, but God hasn't run out of it. So nothing is ever too hard for God. It's a question of how willing we are to allow God by his spirit to break into those situations. There's something about the love of God that is so powerful. You see, even when I feel I've run out of it, like the water going into the jug and overflowing, the Bible says that the love of God can be poured into our hearts so we overflow with that love. We can pray the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace you trust in so you will overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And it's this love that's not just something that is a kind of human sentiment. It's not just trying to be loving. It's the Holy Spirit producing in me a love that I wouldn't naturally have. So now I begin to find this kingdom culture enables me to love people that I would have never, ever dreamed of loving or even being with or wanting to be with. I begin to find I love unlovable people. People who are marginalized that no one else. And where did this love come from? It's the love of God shed abroad in our hearts. So I begin to find now a source of love that enables me to do things I would never ever have done before, ever wanted to do before. But this is a fruit of the Spirit. It's that love pouring in to my heart, that earthen jar and overflowing 
to a world around us. The second of them is joy. And this is particularly significant in the light of what God's been stirring among us this year, where we have felt one of the things God has been prophetically saying to us as church and beyond us, I feel God's saying to the life of the church that God longs to bring a fresh baptism of joy in the Holy Spirit. As words we've shared many times now from Romans 14 and 17, the kingdom of God, this culture of this kingdom. What is this culture like? Is it just about survival? Is it just about eating and drinking? Is it just a material world? No, the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking. What is it about then? What's this culture about? It's about righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. And this is joy in the Holy Spirit. It's the heart of a kingdom culture. This is what the kingdom of God is about. It's a joy, again, that's very different to a world around us. Joy, normally in society and in human nature, is stimulated usually by external circumstances. I say many times you're walking down the road and you meet a friend and they've got a great big smile on their face and you immediately say to them, what's happened to you? And they say to them, I just passed my driving test on the 15th attempt or the house has just got sold, I haven't got gazumped about six times or my job has just got promotion and, and you rejoice with them, you've got a big smile on your face with them. And, but you imagine going down the road and you meet somebody going on the road with a big smile and you say to them, hey, what's happened to you? And they say, oh, I've just failed my driving test for the 16th time and the job has just dropped out and got redundant. In fact, the house has just fallen through and... Well, whatever you smile about. I mean, how can you... But is it a source of joy that's not linked with external circumstances? They can come and go. There's a source of joy that wells up within us. That all my springs of joy are in you. There's a source of inner joy that Jesus speaks of when he talks about those streams of living water welling up inside. So whatever the circumstance of life... Let me just take an area, maybe today, where, where you, to find an area that doesn't change with circumstances, not just because this has happened to me, or this is good. In a consumer society, again, it's usually measured by you know, what we've had or what we've got, or what's happened good to us. But what about when all hell is let loose around us and everything seems... But somehow, there's a river whose streams make glad the people of God. This source of joy... The joy, I just want to touch on a little bit, is a joy that we find in forgiveness. The joy in being forgiven and able to forgive. We may say, but we know there's that joy. We've often said, isn't it? I said the other day about, you know, when we say this kingdom culture, your kingdom come on earth is in heaven. Well, what's it like in heaven? None of us know. But wait a minute, Jesus gives us a glimpse of it. One of the things Jesus says is, in fact, this is what's happening in heaven all the time. You think, oh, what's that? Well, Jesus says that every time on earth... Someone repents, experiences that joy of forgiveness, of God's grace and mercy, the joy of sins forgiven, that realization that Jesus, Son of God, loved me and gave himself for me, and I experience that step of faith in which I turn from all that I know is wrong in my life and reach out and by faith experience that repentance and that faith. Do you know what happens? There's a party in heaven. Jesus says that all the angels in heaven rejoice. Now, you've heard me say many times, I don't know how long an angel rejoices for, but it's only got to be a few seconds because in our global world today, there are more people becoming Christians today than ever in the history of the world. So a few seconds, someone's becoming a Christian. So if the heaven, because it's a global village where South America or Japan, different time scales, then all, all day and night, people becoming, that must mean in heaven there's constant rejoicing, constant joy about the experience of forgiveness on earth. And when we say your kingdom come, our nurses in heaven, then we need to catch something of that culture. That culture that finds joy in the wonder of forgiveness. But also we need to keep fresh that. You know, sometimes we know we've become a Christian years ago. And, and, and it's wonderful that God forgave our sins. But it's not just about what happened when I became a Christian every day of my life. You know, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I need to know that daily. The joy of forgiveness. So Jesus, on this occasion where he'd sent his disciples out, it was their first DTS experience, and they'd gone out two by two because all their experience up to now had been seeing Jesus minister in the power of God, where he'd seen healing and deliverance. Now he's sending them out, and this was their new experience, and, their, and he commissions them and gives them power in his name. 
And they see miracles and wonders. They see people healed and delivered. And they come back so excited. And they're coming from all directions. One from this village, another from that village. And as they arrive and tell, Gee, Lord, you should have heard what went over here. We saw someone healed over here. And so we saw a blind person seen over here. And Lord, we saw somebody delivered. And then another one comes. And they're all so excited. And Jesus says, wait a minute. Jesus says, don't rejoice in this. Don't rejoice in this. I can't. Now, it didn't mean that we don't rejoice in seeing people healed. We don't rejoice in seeing people delivered. That's wonderful. Something that brings much joy. But Jesus says, rather rejoice in this. Now, you may think, well, that's going to be raising the dead or something even greater. You know? No, 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 no. Jesus says, don't rejoice in this. Because you see, tomorrow you may not see the instant answer to your prayer. You may not see that instant healing or deliverance. Circumstances can change. And even success in ministry, that's not the source of my joy. Wonderful as it is. But what is then? You rejoice that your names are written in heaven. But we know that. I mean, uh, no, 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 no. I want you to constantly. I want you to wake in the morning with a sense of wonder. My name is written in heaven. I want you daily in the middle of a day when you're out just think, oh, it's so wonderful. I've been forgiven. We used to sing a little chorus once. It went like this. Uh, well, I won't sing it. I'll be sitting uh, with much joy. But you say, I get so excited, Lord, every time I realize I'm forgiven. I'm forgiven. The sheer excitement and wonder. But do we lose that? Is that something we just associate our first few days of giving a testimony of coming to faith? Or is there something about the wonder, the joy of forgiveness? Because that's where somehow, when we discover in a culture sources of joy that are not linked with circumstances, even fruitfulness in ministry, so that's why we struggle at times. We don't see the answer to our prayers. Uh, we prayed for deliverance or healing and we haven't seen the answer. And we struggle sometimes because uh, we lose the joy and we lose the effectiveness. I won't touch too much tonight because I always, what, 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 what do I start, Dave? Tell me. Dave, Dave nods at me and gives me little winks when I'm here. But what, what time do you want me to finish, Dave? You waved me. Okay, right. That moment, right. Um, I have been known to go over time at times. But... Um, <laughs> at, but, but but um, uh, you're here tonight, knowing I was speaking, so you must be still patient with that. But um, uh, you see, Jesus was such an amazing example of prayer. And I touched a few weeks back about Jesus' prayer life, that secret life of prayer. He says that he often went to solitary places to pray. He regularly withdrew to pray. And therefore, we don't have a lot of recording of it. There's no one there to record it. But those moments when we do get little glimpses of it, it's amazing. Because, you know, when Jesus prayed, you think, well, this is going to be it now, as far as... But I shared the other day that moment where Jesus prayed towards the end of his life with Peter. And Peter's about to go through a testing time, a sifting time. And Jesus says, Simon, Simon, Satan has desired to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you. Now, that would be the greatest source of comfort if you know, someone was to say to you, look, Rob, you're going to go through a testing time. You're going to get really a shaking time, a sifting time, but I pray to you. I'm sure I'd say thanks so much for your prayers. But if Jesus were to say to me, Rob, I've prayed for you, that would be my real assurance, isn't it? You might almost think that's it. I'm, maybe I won't get the shift, sifting now. Maybe the, 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 the challenge is... But Jesus prayed that prayer for Peter. What, what went wrong then? Because within a matter of just a short while, Peter denies Jesus. Three times. That was after the prayer. Well, what happened to Jesus' prayer? Because Jesus had prayed, Satan's going to sift you, but I prayed for you. But here's the interesting thing, and I think where we see, understand sometimes in our way we handle prayer, because sometimes we handle prayer, you know, we pray today, and if we haven't seen the answer tomorrow, we're disappointed, but we've defined what that answer's going to be, and if sometimes God answers a different way to what we expect, because what Jesus prayed for Peter was not that he would never fail or never make a mistake. What he prayed was, I have prayed that your faith will not fail. Now, in fact, he did fail, Jesus. He made lots of mistakes. In fact, when you look back on his life, such a checkered life, and yet God was still working out the answer to that prayer. At the age of 80 years of age, Peter eventually writes his first letter, and he says, though now for a season, if need be, we're going through all sorts of manifold trials and testing, yet my faith, being tested like gold, he says, we rejoice with a joy unspeakable and full of glory. 
So his faith had come through that testing. And here now, like gold, you think, but goodness me, that wasn't an answer to prayer I expected. I would have thought, you know, the next day would have been through it all. There wouldn't have been testing or trials. If Jesus was praying, there wouldn't be any sifting. But it's not the way it often happens in prayer. There's a whole process, often a pathway that prayer takes us that we need to be able to hold on and be able to trust God in those praying and see that unfolding of God's purposes. But sometimes we lose our joy after the first hurdle or two because we felt it didn't happen. It didn't happen like we lost. So now we've lost the joy in prayer. That peace, I better hasten. This is only the third one, but I'm not going to do all nine in detail. So peace is the third of them. You know, for each of these, when Jesus speaks, he, he says those amazing words where he appears to his disciples. They're so terrified because they'd seen Jesus cruelly crucified. It was all over the bottom and fallen out of their world and suddenly appears to them, absolutely terrified and fearful. He says to them, peace be with you. Then he says these words, my peace, my peace I give to you. This is a peace that the world cannot give. There's no other way you can get this peace. You can't find it in a bottle of pills. You can't find it in just a, the best holiday you can get in the sun. This is a peace that the world cannot give you. There's a source of peace that is found in Jesus, that he is our peace. There's a source of joy that's in him. Jesus said, when my joy is in you, then your joy will be full. And it's this source of joy that is in him. That's why when the scripture says, rejoice in the Lord always, you think, I often say, you know, you don't mean always, do you? But as Christians, we should be happy as often as we can. No, 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 always. But Rob, what about pain and grief? What about heartache? What about not just me, but someone close to me? And I see distress and heartache and disappointment and bereavement. But there's a joy even in the midst of suffering. Right? Jesus, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross. Where's this joy? You see, it's not that you rejoice in your circumstances, but you rejoice in the Lord always. There's a source of joy in him. So when he says, my joy, there's a source of peace in him when he says, my peace. My peace I give to you. It's a world, peace that the world cannot give. Now, his peace is not the absence of problems. So often we think, when Jesus prayed for Peter, Satan says, I sift you, Peter, but I prayed for you, so that's, you won't get any problems now. No. God's peace is not the absence of problems. It's the reality of the presence of God in the midst of the problems. That's something very different. Though all hell is let loose around you, though that city is shaken and the mountains fall into the sea, yet there is a river when everything else is shaken around me that makes glad the people of God. Peace like a river attendeth my soul. Sorrows like sea billows roll. God has taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. The man who wrote that hymn had just lost all his family in a tragic accident. Yet he could write, when peace like a river. Where does this peace come from? It's the peace of God. You can't manufacture it. It's like joy, you see. If sometimes we speak about joy, we end up just with the impression Christians ought to be happy. Then we go out the door thinking I ought to smile as often as I can. And, and you know, I put on that face, that smile when I'm meeting somebody because I'm a Christian, I ought to be happy. No, that won't work. It just becomes hollow and empty. There's got to be that source of joy, that fruit of the Spirit, that welling up. And likewise with peace, if I just think, you know, I, 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 ought to, I didn't ought to be worried and not be anxious. There'll be some folk here tonight even here tonight, you're really anxious. This past week, you've been really stressed. You feel under pressure. You wake up in the morning, if there's a cloud hanging over your life. By temperament, you tend to be a cautious person who tends to see the potential repercussions of every action and always tend to somehow interpret as if you know, it could be happening to you. It's like, you know, sometimes you're out with somebody and driving, uh, somebody toots a horn, they always think it's me, it must be me, what have I done? You know, kind of, you know, that feeling sometimes, it's always me, that must be... And you live with that sort of tension sometimes by nature, by temperament. But there's something about the Holy Spirit's work in us that is able to cause a source within us of peace. It's not something I'm manufacturing. It's not me just trying to be peaceful. It's not me just saying to myself, right, breathe deeply. Though breathing deeply can help. There's some helpful physical exercise in meditation that can really help us sometimes just to be able to calm and that. But that's not the source of it. That's the difference between just human meditation, which is just a physical exercise or a breathing exercise. But the source of it is that fruit of the Spirit. 
It's a peace that passes understanding. So sometimes you can be in the midst of a situation where, where it seems a bombing raid all around you, and you're in the midst of a blitz and everything, and somehow there's a kind of that oasis where you feel an inner sense of peace. I shared with you many times, I can remember that day when Pam first heard that she had breast cancer. You know, you get that call from the hospital and been for your mammogram, and, and that sense where it seems if the whole rest of your life suddenly concertined in, you think, but one of the amazing things, you've talked to Pam, I can still remember that day for Pam saying, you know, Rob, I feel an overwhelming sense of God's peace. I can't understand it. Naturally, I ought to feel really well, but I feel. And it's a peace of God that passes understanding. If you just add up all the factors and put them together and... Well, you couldn't be at peace, but sometimes there's a peace of God that transcends human understanding. And, and when Paul speaks of it in Philippians 4, he says, be anxious for nothing. Oh, you think, wait a minute. You mean try not to worry too often about too many things. No, be anxious for nothing. But Rob, you don't know the situations I'm in. You don't, I don't know what the situations are, but I know this. There is a source of peace, whatever the circumstance of life. Whereby when scripture says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, through prayer, supplication, lay those requests, those problems, those potential fears, and lay them out before God. And the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard not just your heart. Sometimes we end up with this sentimental feeling, well, I've got peace in my heart, but I'm really worried in my mind. No, it'll guard your heart and your mind. It's the peace of God that passes understanding. That source of peace is in him. I haven't time to deal with all those other areas, but there's some amazing things that are about this whole culture of the kingdom. There's a patience. There's a kindness. There's a goodness. There's a faithfulness. There's a gentleness. These are marks of the kingdom. Not just because by temperament, I'm a quiet, gentle person. What about the person who's boisterous and extrovert? Does that mean they could never know that fruit? No. There's a gentleness that transcends whatever our human temperament can be. That's why to discover a richness that's there. What about the person who by nature isn't patient, they're just to go and get it, but the fruit of the Spirit can produce patience in us. A patience, a kindness, a goodness, faithfulness, a gentleness. Finally, self-control. I want to just focus a little on this because it's most likely one of the most misunderstood of all the fruit aspects of the fruit of the Spirit. Sometimes we think of self-control, you know, as a person who could be losing their temper or anything, but they, they bite their tongue, or bite their lip, and they got self-control. You know, it's kind of self-under-control kind of thing, that way in which, uh, you know, we do it. But this is more than just my human disciplines of me. Sometimes we think self-control is self-in-control, where it's about being assertive. And there's lots of interesting classes and books you read on self-assertion, about being self-in-control. You know, you're, you're doing it in that self-assertion. But, but this work of the Holy Spirit is to bring self under control. See, self-preservation is the first instinct of human nature, all human nature throughout history, it's a basic human nature, self-preservation. But self-interest is the most basic human motivation. We, in our sophisticated Western world, we, we cover it up in all sorts of ways, but it's that egocentric self, that self-centeredness, where it's what I want to be, what people think about me, it's about I, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that, and was she talking about me? It's about I. That's human nature. You can't help it, it's human nature. I've had some interesting conversation over the years. If any of you hear from China, I remember once we were one of our Chinese professors that was here, we were talking about, about uh, culture and the cultural revolution. And what is it that shapes a culture? And I was saying, but... Uh, he said, but you know, it is the party and it's the state that you, you put the state first. But I said, but, but what about human nature? Oh, he says, you can't change that, he says. And the great challenge for any cultural revolution was that ultimately there's a human selfishness. You look after your own interest. 
And as long as you think the state serves those interests, then you serve those. But is it possible to change that? Is it possible to see a cultural change? That you could have a higher motivation for life than self? Here in this passage, it's the closing exercise. It comes in a powerful way. It says, therefore, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified self. That sinful nature that always wants what I want, that's always about a love that's getting rather than giving, that's always my interests, it's crucified self. So what does that mean? Have I died? No, I'm still alive. Nevertheless, I live, but it's no longer I that live but Christ that lives in me. For me to live is Christ. I now have a higher motivation for life than my own self-interest. And it's to reproduce that life of Jesus. It's a new culture. And what happens in life is, it's about bringing ourselves to be in step with that. So the closing expression is a very powerful expression. It says, therefore, those who live by the Spirit keep in step with the Spirit. There are many of us here tonight who are Christians, who come to know and to love Jesus, who experience the Spirit of God in our lives, but things happen in our life that just get us out of step with the Spirit. To know that rhythm of life where we're living in step with the Holy Spirit. We feel the pulse of the Spirit's purpose in our life. Somehow that rhythm of life, that whole way of life, that kingdom culture has about it that we're in step with the Holy Spirit. You know, sometimes you know, at school you do those three-legged races where you, you're, you're tied together, your middle, you know, in the middle with your left leg and their right leg, as it were. And it's a difficult thing, but the, the way to win it, if you ever run a, a three-legged race, you've got to get yourself. So you do a little practice, one, two, three, one, two, first leg, you know, and you've got to make sure you're in step because the moment you've got a step, you fall over. But it's how to get that rhythm of being in step. What is it to be? somehow tied inwardly to the Holy Spirit in a way that I'm in step with the Holy Spirit. Somehow, that mind of Christ is the very thoughts I think are in tune with him. The appetites and attitudes, the way in which I live, the motivation of my life. I feel a rhythm of life where I'm in step with the Holy Spirit. Those promptings of God's Spirit where a still small voice in me says, this is the way, walk in it. And, and I hear a sense of an inner quickening of God's Spirit and there's that sense in which I'm living in step with the Holy Spirit. So it's not just an occasional happening. It's not just an occasional spiritual experience. It's a way of life. It's a culture. It's a culture of spiritual fruit. My prayer tonight is that for many of us here, we might sense, even as we have ministry around communion, it would be wonderful if many of us here were just to experience in a fresh way the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Until you're full, you can't overflow. The fruit of the Spirit is the overflow of the Spirit in our life. Unless we're living in that fullness, there isn't that overflow. And my invitation tonight is to come and to experience afresh that fullness of the Spirit. I'm going to pray, and then Dave, he hasn't even waved to me yet. He's going to come. If he did wave, I didn't notice it. <laughs> Father, come by your Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father. When you brought us to that new life in Jesus, you didn't just then leave us to get on. We're trying to live it in our own strength. For us to be trying to manufacture love or joy or peace. Thank you that by your Holy Spirit, you can produce in us that fruit of the Spirit. Help us let go of our own efforts and allow you, by your Spirit, to have your way in us. That love, that joy, that peace, that patience, that kindness, that goodness, that faithfulness, that gentleness, that self-control, Come, Holy Spirit, come. Bring us tonight, many of us here, bring us in a new way, in step with your Spirit. Come now, Lord. As we break bread, may there be a conscious sense in which we sense you bringing us in step with your Spirit. In Jesus' lovely and precious name. Amen.